Good morning, everyone. Hi. Congratulations <laughs> for finding Tresseter. <laughs> Yay. How was the walkover from check-in this morning, right? <laughs> I made the walk, too, so. <laughs> My name is Karen Cooper. I am the Director of Financial Aid here at Stanford, and I'm here with my colleague, T.J. Fletcher, from Student Financial Services, um, and we're going to talk with, to you about money. The first thing you're doing here at Admit Weekend is talking about money, um, which I told some of you already, and I warned you I'd repeat this joke. You are my favorite crowd. So you may have seen on the agenda that we repeat this. We'll do this again tomorrow and Saturday as well. It's the same stuff. You don't have to come again. But I really like the Thursday morning crowd because you are the ones who need to make sure you understand this. And this is going to work before you can enjoy the rest of the weekend, right? <laughs> Compared to the folks who come on Saturday morning. Uh, they're in a different mindset than you all are. So I appreciate your mindset. Very happy to have you here and hope that we'll be able to answer all of your questions or at least the ones you've thought of so far. So TJ and I have been doing this for a while and we've got a presentation that I hope will cover the majority of the basic questions and we'll try to, to cut ourselves off by about 11 o'clock and then we'll do questions and answers. Sound good? Okay, and we are being recorded. We're going to put this on the web for uh, people who aren't able to be here this weekend. So if you have a really embarrassing question, we'll be able to edit that out. Uh, just kidding. Um, and I, I will have some staff here too by the end of the session. So we'll have uh, people here who can answer those individual questions as well. All right, so it looks like we're getting settled. And let's go ahead and get started. So what we're going to talk about, and I hit the button twice, is um, Stanford's financial aid program, uh, financing opportunities, what it looks like. You know, we, For those of you who are receiving aid, we've given you an award letter for one year. But what's going to happen? This is a four-year commitment, right? We'll talk about that a little bit. And TJ will go into details about billing and paying and all of those important questions about how things work. So, the financial aid office, you may have noticed us, we're in Montag Hall, which is across the street on Galvez from the Alumni Center where you checked in. So, staff are there all weekend. If you've got questions, you want to sit down with somebody and talk specifically about your individual situation, feel free to head on over to Montag Hall. So, there we handle, you know, basic financial aid counseling, we're the ones who are doing the awardings of of financial aid so we can give you all of those details. Uh, even if you're not receiving need-based assistance from Stanford, we manage outside scholarships for your sons and daughters. So th those kinds of questions we can handle as well, as well as federal work study. All of that happens in the financial aid office. So where are you in the financial aid process at this point? Um, hopefully, you have completed the financial aid application, which consists of those three pieces um, and are familiar with those terms, so I won't go into detail there. Hopefully, you have also received an award letter from us, and the important thing to note about that, the very first one we will print out and mail to you. You got it in the admission packet, many of you, um, but from this point on, uh, we will only be sharing those electronically. Students are able to access their award letters as a PDF through our Access Student System, which they have the ability to log into now. So moms and dads, you're going to want to ask your student to share that information with you. They're the ones who have access. So hopefully we're here because we are having these conversations about how to manage that net cost figure that's on your award letter. And we just want to make sure we understand how all of this is going to work. So when we're putting together a financial aid package, this is the formula that's important to us. We look at the cost of attendance. We subtract from that a parent contribution that we actually calculate. We subtract from that as well some student responsibility. And whatever's left is what we award in scholarship funds. So this is why conversations about I, I, I can't 
I need more scholarship, right, turn into conversations about why is that parent contribution too high? Or why is that student responsibility too high? Or are we missing something in the cost of attendance that we need to account for? So this is how we determine scholarship eligibility. And I will talk in more detail, because I can see the hungry looks in your eyes, um, about each one of those components. Uh, this is the formula that's important to us. But the formula that I think should be important to you at this point as you're comparing institutions and financial aid offers from other schools is this one on the right, cost of attendance, less scholarship and grant that you've been offered, that's the net cost. You know, there may be loans available, there may be work study jobs available to help meet that net cost, but the bottom line is that's what's going to come from you or your student in one way or another. So that's an excellent way to compare financial aid offers from school to school. And our award letter just happens to be arranged that way. Cost of attendance, scholarships and grants, what the net cost is, and then these things that are at the bottom, the parent contribution, student responsibility, those are things that we suggest you're going to need in order to be able to meet that cost of attendance. And it's really up to you how you manage that. So let's talk in more detail about the cost of attendance. Um, and I'm using uh, Leland Jr.'s award letter here. Um, and if you stop and think about it, Leland was actually a, a very rich man and probably wouldn't qualify for any aid, but <laughs> it's a good example. So on the award letter, we list cost of attendance. And you can see the components here. Tuition, room and board, the fees that we charge, there are also allowances for personal expenses, books and supplies, and even travel to and from home. Uh, twice a year is what that's supposed to represent. So the full cost of attendance includes both the things that we will bill you for, that TJ will bill you for, um, <laughs> as well as the expenses that we recognize students have in order to be full participating members of the community. Um, so we want to take that into account. This personal expense figure, 29.25 for next year, is actually based on surveys of current students, both students on aid and not on aid, the, the general population. Um, we're asking students, how much do you spend on things like uh, entertainment, meals outside of your meal plan, uh, sporting events, personal items, your phone bill, um, those kinds of things. Yeah, that, remember that one. Um, and so that 2925 represents an average of what uh, students who are current students actually pay. So even if you're not on aid, I think it's important to take note of that figure um, because if your student is telling you, I need $1,000 a month to be at Stanford, um, that's probably not true. <laughs> so that's why that one's important. Uh, but keep that in mind. It's, it, this is the comprehensive costs. This isn't how much we bill you for. It's really meant to be a full reflection of what we think the costs are going to be. And then the next section of the award letter is about uh, the scholarships and grants that we offer. So in this example, um, only scholarship from Stanford has been offered. And that means that the total net cost in this case is 20500 So that's what will need to be paid one way or another towards the cost of attendance, towards those full costs, not necessarily just towards tuition. The parent contribution. So this is the piece, right? This is really the, the secret sauce for what makes the scholarship determination is that calculation of the parent contribution. And those of you who have been through the process know that we asked you lots and lots of questions, right? Um, you've practically told us uh, all of the personal information about your family. We in the financial aid office get to know you very well over the next four years. Um, and, and do know, please, that we take that information very seriously and keep it confidential in the financial aid office. We use that information that you've provided to us on the FAFSA and the profile to calculate an expected parent contribution. 
we need to use a formula to do that because we want, our goal is to treat families equitably, right? Families with similar financial circumstances, we should have a similar expectation of their parent contribution. And families that make just a little bit more than another family, their parent contribution should be just a little bit more. Um, so we use a basic formula to help us in that calculation. At the same time, we know that show us two families that have the same adjusted gross income, and we're probably going to see two very different situations, right? Family size is part of that analysis. Number of kids in college is part of that analysis. The family's assets are part of that analysis. So all of that information is being taken into account when we're calculating that expected parent contribution, even down to where you're, where you're living. Um, for our institutional funds, we look at whether or not you're in a, a high cost area. So the formula is complex. So we have two seats available. We decided uh, but, several but years ago now that That's families okay. needed some simple okay. take... benchmarks to really understand what was possible in the financial aid process. We've always had a really strong financial aid program. Um, but we thought that families were looking at our sticker price and saying, oh, that's just too much. I, there's no way we can handle that. So we came out with these simple statements and have, have updated them since we first came out in 2008. And we said, if your total income is less than $65,000, parents, and, and you've got typical assets for that income range, there's nothing unusual going on in your family, um, that those parents will not be expected to contribute towards the cost of attendance. And for families with income less than 125000 that we're going to make sure tuition is covered at Stanford. And if you think back to our formula, that means the parent contribution can't be more than about 15500 With a parent contribution at that level, the amount of scholarship that you qualify for is full tuition. So if you think of those two as data points, right? It doesn't mean people with higher incomes don't qualify for aid either. So we just continue to go up the scale. It's just harder to make that kind of simple statement for families with higher incomes. Um, so we do have available on our website a calculator that uh, by answering its 11 required questions. Um, you can get a general sense of what kind of scholarship funds you might qualify for from Stanford. Um, if you have income less than 65000 you can know that without having to go through the calculator. But that was our motivation be behind putting those messages out, is really letting people know how good our financial aid program really is. Um, Close to half of our students receive need-based aid from Stanford. About 30% of our undergraduate population qualify under one of these two policies. Right? So students are here at Stanford from all walks of life, um, which is really great. That is our aim. The other important point that I want to make about the parent contribution is that this is toward the cost of attendance, right? It, always the first question we get is, so when do I have to write that check for my parent contribution, right? There is not a time when Stanford's going to ask you, I need that 15500 right now, right? Um, it's, it's incorporated. We think you're going to need to spend about that much towards the total cost of attendance. You might be paying for the plane ticket, right? You might be helping to pay for books. Um, so there are, are lots of ways that you can make that parent contribution, okay? Student responsibility. So we do feel it's important that as students, as the ones who get to live here, who get to enjoy this experience, uh, and who are benefiting most from this experience, take some responsibility for those expenses. And what we have done for the last uh, seven or eight years now is expect students to contribute a minimum of $5,000, which sounds like a lot of money. Um, you know, I, I, I have kids myself, and if I told them, you're going to have to pay 5000 for next year, they would say, Mom, where's your checkbook? Um, but we break that down for most students. This probably looks familiar to many of you. The student contribution of $2,200 and work during the academic year of $2,800, right? 
So by that, we're saying, if you save up your money over, your, over the summer from your summer job um, and are able to have $2,200 available when you come on campus and you get a job on campus and work just eight to 10 hours a week is all it takes to earn that $2,800. We pay students starting at about $14 an hour. Um, we are in California, right? Um, that if a student is doing that, they should be able to handle maybe their personal expenses on their own. Uh, maybe buying their books on their own. So I think as a family, what's really helpful before you come to campus is sit down, look at the award letter, look at that cost of attendance, and have a conversation about who's going to pay which pieces, who's taking responsibility for what, right? What, what are you going to er use the, the earnings that you're getting from? Now, we, we say 2,800 and 2,200, which sounds very official, right? Uh, we're trying to send a message that it's really up to the students to decide how they take care of this student responsibility. If they've got a great job over the summer and they're able to save 4,000, it means they don't need to work as much during the academic year. If they've got an unpaid internship that is a fabulous opportunity, but they're not able to earn anything over the summer, Maybe they can work a few more hours during the academic year, or maybe they can even take out a student loan. Right? Student loans are not necessarily a bad thing. Um, we don't expect students to borrow as part of their financial aid package. We don't take them into account before we award scholarships. Um, but if a student has that kind of opportunity and decides to borrow a $2,000 student loan so they've got enough money to make it through the next year, I think that's a great use of the student loan programs. So that's the student responsibility. Another way students can handle that student responsibility is by earning outside scholarships. And by that I mean that, you know, the private scholarships, the Rotary Club scholarships, the PTA scholarships, all, national merit, all of those things um, can be used to meet that student responsibility. Um, you will be asked to report those outside scholarships to the financial aid office through ACCESS. We have a tool that you can use in ACCESS to do that starting in mid-May after they have all said yes and matriculated in our, in our system. Um, you'd let us know about those outside scholarships that are coming. And if you're receiving need-based aid, what we will do is use those outside scholarships to replace academic year earnings or the student contribution down to zero. If the amount of scholarship that they're receiving is greater than, those outside scholarships is greater than their student responsibility, it does reduce Stanford scholarship at that point. Okay, another way to say that, to be very blunt, is outside scholarships don't replace the parent contribution. Okay, so um, if you're getting need-based scholarship, think about that. We do allow students to do things like add to their cost of attendance for a computer if they need to buy a new laptop when they're coming to campus. And if they're gonna see some of their scholarship reduced because of outside <coughs> scholarships, they can use that, those scholarship funds towards that computer, right? So that's a conversation with the financial aid office if you're expecting lots of those outside scholarships. But we find many students are getting those, you know, the $2,000 PTA scholarship, et cetera, and those are really useful to students, very much so. So uh, to show how this works, when a student receives an outside scholarship, it increases the st scholarships and grants that are shown on the award letter. Uh, which reduces the net cost because there's more gift money coming in for that and it reduces the student responsibility, if you can see way down on the bottom there. Um, simple math. All right, so I've danced around loans a little bit. Let's talk about loans. So loans are available for students even though we haven't awarded them up front if a student is getting need-based scholarship funds. But those of you who applied and we said, I'm sorry, there's no 
need-based scholarship available for you, we've let you know about the federal student loans that are available to you. So this 5,500 might look familiar to some of you. That's the standard amount that's available to a first-year student. Um, we can add those loans for anybody on request. So some students use those, again, to help with that student responsibility. Some use them to help their parents with their parent contribution. That's okay. So if you're thinking about borrowing and you want to compare the student loans um, and see if that's more advantageous to you, that's one way to handle that <coughs> debt. I should note that um, of our students who graduated in 2016, only 21% of them actually had any debt. That means we, we love to say, yeah, we love to say 79% graduated debt free, right, which I think is great. Um, but those who did borrow had average indebtedness, median indebtedness of 14,599. So, yay. So, you know, a little, I want to send the message. I don't, I, I don't like saying loans are bad, right? It, a little bit alone. It, if it's, Take a loan so you don't have to work 20 hours a week and do better in your academics. The loan is well worth it. So our students who are borrowing are doing it intelligently. They're able to pay it back. We have a less than 1% default rate on our federal student loans. So uh, our students are able to manage that. All right, so the, to give you more details about the loan programs, the federal direct student loan is the program that is most widely available. So anybody who is a US citizen or permanent resident who completes the FAFSA can qualify for a student loan, the direct student loan. It uh, doesn't have anything to do with need for the most part. Uh, those unsubsidized loans are available to everybody. And by unsubsidized, I mean the interest starts accruing while they're still in school. They don't have to make payments, but that interest is accruing. If you do demonstrate federal need for those loans, which unfortunately not many of our students do because we're meeting their need with scholarship funds, right? Um, then you can get an unsub a, a subsidized loan, which means that interest is, uh, you're not responsible for the interest during the time that you're in school. So the, the rates for these loans are set on July 1 every year for the coming year. It's a fixed rate loan, so the year that you take out the loan determines the rate that that loan will be for the life of the loan. The current rate is 3.76%. It has a just over 1% origination fee. Those are the fees that are charged with it. Uh, the rate is based on a 10-year T-bill plus 2%. 2.05% for those of you who are following the Treasury bill market. You can estimate what it's going to be on July 1. Um, first year students are limited to $5,500. Uh, second year students, $6,500. And then as juniors and seniors, they can take out $7,500 a year. Um, so you can see with these limits, students really can't get into trouble with the federal student loan programs. Um, Students who are relying on this program are not the ones that you hear about in the soft <laughs> stories on the media um, because of these limits. As undergraduates, they really can't get themselves too deeply in debt. Uh, but that does mean if you're hoping for some loans to really help with Stanford's costs, that it doesn't get you very far, right? Um, so the federal government does have a parent loan program available that allows you as parents of dependent students to borrow up to the full cost of attendance, less any other aid that the student has received. Um, the interest rate's a little bit higher. Uh, the current interest rate is 6.31%. It has a 4% origination fee. Uh, again, it has a 10-year repayment period. You can defer those payments while the student's still enrolled in school, but that interest is accruing on the loan, so that gets expensive. Um, to apply for these loans, you would do it through the Financial Aid Office website starting July 1, you know, mid-July. Gives us plenty of time to get that processed before the first bills are due. So I put that out there to let you know that is an option. Uh, but it, it can be expensive for some families. Depending on your financial circumstances, um, a private or alternative loan might be a better deal. There are some years when I stand up here and say, don't even think about private loans. Um, but right now, there are some deals to be had if you've got good credit. Um, 
that what you lose with the private student loan programs is the repayment flexibility that the federal student loan programs have. So for federal student loans, students can defer payment as long as they're enrolled. There are um, forbearance options that, you know, there's income-based repayment. If their income is low, they pay just a percentage of their income. And if they do that for 20 years and they still owe on their student loans, the rest is forgiven. So there's low income protections built in there. Um, there's a public service loan forgiveness option where if students make that minimum payment for 10 years and they're working in, a non, in the nonprofit world, um, they can have the remainder of their loan forgiven after 10 years. So there's lots of options with the federal student loans that are not available in the private student loan market. Quick question? Your head, what would you consider to be a good deal? And number two, uh, um, I've been reading some stuff about the uh, forgiveness program. Um, you know, maybe that's going to go away. So I'd like your perspective. Yeah. So the um, a good deal is anything that has an interest rate less than this, um, which which a, a lot of uh, of the private loans do have better interest rates at this point. Um, I see a lot of our families using home equity lines of credit, for example, um, rather than choosing a parent plus loan. Because of the interest rate differences? Yeah, because of the cost of the loan program. Okay. Um, and it, the, the public service loan forgiveness, yes, we've got a new Congress. Um, that, that law is just over 10 years old, and so we're, getting, we're just now getting to the first cases where people are qualifying for the public service loan forgiveness. So there are lots of questions about how that's gonna be carried forward. Um, but the terms of the loan are what you sign when you sign your promissory note. So if it's still available when you take out the loan. I'm gonna ask that we hold questions um, to the end, because those of you who came in, we're recording this session, so it gets a little complicated. But it, did I answer your basics? Yeah, thank you. I don't want to confuse anybody either. So uh, what happens for the next three years, right? We've got a, a plan that will get you through year one. We've been talking with you financial aid one year at a time, right? And that is a little bit stressful. So there is another aid application every year. Um, same information, we're going to require the FAFSA and the profile. Uh, we don't ask you to go through that IDOC process and turn in tax returns, complete tax returns again. We just ask for, for your W-2s. Um, and those of you who haven't found it yet, we have a document upload on our website um, that is secure. That's a great way to submit information to the financial aid office. Um, so that's the process for coming years. We give you a later deadline, April 30th, for our continuing students. So they're all stressing out this week. <laughs> um, but we deal with the freshmen, and then we'll turn to dealing with everybody else. So the reason why we collect that financial aid material again for another year, uh, you know, as you've heard a thousand times, we are a need-based financial aid program. So you can think of it as our check-in with you to make sure things haven't changed in your family situation. If you, you know, everything is roughly the same from the year before, you know, maybe you've got a two or three percent increase in your salary. Um, Stanford may have a three percent increase in tuition too. So we're, we're checking in every year and looking at those changes to the cost of attendance to, to just to make sure that nothing's changed with the family situation. If it's similar, you can expect a similar kind of financial aid package for four years. Um, the big changes that we see are you know, family changes, uh, someone changes a job, uh, that kind of employment situation. Um, siblings in college, this is the big one. So if you have two kids in college this year, we're giving you a deal, right? We calculate, what our formula does is calculate that expected parent contribution, and we say we recognize that you've got more than one kid to pay for in college, and we split that contribution up among the kids. So when there's only one in college, what happens to the parent contribution? 
So don't say I didn't warn you. Um, if you have big concerns about that, you are welcome to use our calculator as a great way to do that kind of what if testing. Or since you're here this weekend, if you want to stop in and talk to somebody in the financial aid office about, you know, if my family situation changes, what, what would this look like? Um, we're happy to have those conversations with you. Because it is important. You have a, a sense of what the four years are going to look like. Uh, and the converse is true, absolutely. For those of you who only have one now, but there's a, a sibling coming up really closely, then aid can change pretty dramatically in those years when you've got more than one in college. <laughs> So I talk about that annual reapplication process as sort of a check-in with you to see what's happening. Um, but also, during the year, if things are, if you're having trouble making those payments, if things have changed, if, you know, God forbid there's a health situation, if somebody changes employment during the year, things are looking worse, let us know about that. We do have the ability to make adjustments throughout the year. We are not you know, a public institution that says you can appeal to us once and then you're done, right? So we can make adjustments throughout the year for those kinds of situations. My joke here is, you know, if you win the lottery, you don't have to run in and tell us about that. We'll figure that out when you reapply, <laughs> right? Um, but if th the converse happens, do let us know about that and we will do our best to help you through that situation. So I know that's a hard message because you don't know us, right? Um, and we, we ask lots of personal information. Um, but that's the goal of our financial aid program, to, to be there to help you get through this. So with that, I am going to turn it over to TJ to talk about the fun stuff. Um, and then we'll be back to answer questions at the end. Thank you very much. I always love working with Karen on this because she gives all the money, and I take all the money. Um, but the more she gives, the less I have to collect. And as a bill collector, that, that makes my life very, very easy. But before I jump in, and I'm not going to take too much of your time today, before I jump in, I would just like to see who's in the audience today. And, and by that, I'm wondering how many of you are uh, West Coast families? West Coast families. How many of you are East Coast families? How many of you are somewhere in the middle? Uh, <laughs> great. Those flyover states, right? Oh, not really. Um, and what about international? Any international students? So welcome, everyone. Alum. Do we have any alumni with us today? Welcome. Welcome back to the farm. It's always good to see you. Um, all righty. Um, as I said, um, um, I am the bill collector for student tuition and fees. And this is, I'm thrilled every year to come and speak with you because I don't often get an audience. You know, bill collector is, is not a very fun or sexy job. And um, uh, so, so I'm really pleased to be able to speak with you today. So let me, let me begin by just saying, now that you understand, or you have been at least given the information to understand where the aid or the financial aid comes from, I'm going to give you a little bit of information about, um, you know, let me get the, get that. yeah, how this whole thing works. How does it work? Because financial aid does this formula to come up with these, these great packages, and then at some point, you're going to have to pay the pay the bill, right? So the way that that works is that um, we, we actually about, um, shoot, um, late July, what we take all of the student tuition and fees and we gather them from, from everywhere and we put them on the student account. And that is in late July that we do that. And in August, we are going to prepare a bill. And we prepare that bill, and it's going to be available for students and whom they want to see the bill. And that's about in the August time frame. That bill is going to be the whole balance as of that time for all charges, you know, room, board, tuition, associated fees, et cetera. However, the bill's going to also have a line on it that's going to say, this is what we anticipate um, your aid to be, and that's based on what you've accepted, right? So any aid that the student has accepted can be subtracted from that to see if there's any balance left. Sometimes there is, um, and sometimes there isn't. But if there's a balance left, the 
payment due date then, the student will pay um, in, in the September timeline. And then in late September is when the financial aid office will actually, what we call, disperse that money to the account. So um, it's, here's another way of looking at it. This is an actual a bill from, from, from a year that, that, that will be given. The first thing I call to your attention is the payment due date and the amount. At the, at the very, and that looks like a big, big number. It is a big, big number. Um, then this section is just a summary for those of you who just want a summary. Well, what, term, what the term summary looks like, the credits applied, and the charges. And this is the important piece that I was telling you about. Make sure that you, whatever the anticipated aid shows, the anticipated scholarship, the anticipated aid, subtract that from the balance. Because that's all that would need to be, that's the amount that would need to be paid by the due date. The due dates that we have, um, we, we have things called the big bill. So, so we have autumn, winter, and spring are the terms of an academic year. And those are the dates that we have the big bill that includes tuition and the, and the quarterly fees, like your, your housing is a quarterly fee. So it's really, this is, this is a daunting slide, and it's not necessary for you to, to memorize it because you'll, you'll see it and you'll be notified. But basically, on August 20, we're going to bill, and it's due the 15th. We always bill on about the 20th of the month and it's due the following month on the 15th. Um, and we have little, we bill every month, even though we have three really big bills during the quarter, we do bill every month. Why, you might say, why do you bill every month if I gotta pay the quarterly tuitions um, on these particular dates? The reason um, you might have a quarterly bill is that there are charges that can land on the student account that happen uh, more frequently than quarterly. For example, if your son or daughter takes um, cable television in their, in their residence hall, that's a separate fee and they bill on a monthly basis. If, you're, um, um, if you want to buy additional cardinal dollars, and cardinal dollars are food dollars. If you want to buy, some students want to buy additional dollars um, outside of the board plan that's in their residence hall. They might want to purchase additional dollars for um, eat, eating on campus. Um, there can be adjustments that hit the account. So um, some of the courses that students take will have fees associated with them, ranging on $10, $15 for whatever the, that course might be. If the student drops or changes that course or adds that course during the term, those, those costs would come on or go off. So those are examples as well. And then there are also something called the Stanford Card Plan Retail Purchases. Now you might wonder what the Stanford Card Plan is. This is a program that is a per term line of credit for our students where they use their university ID card and they can make purchases in lieu of cash at many or most of the on-campus retail um, facilities. This program was designed to allow students that needed to buy bookstore purchases ahead of perhaps of getting their aid dispersed or getting their scholarships so that they could buy the supplies they needed for the first day of class so that they have everything, even if they want to buy it when they first arrived at campus, this would give them the opportunity to purchase those things. The majority, the largest majority of, of use of this program is for bookstore and supply purchases. Other retails on campus allow it to be used, like food shops, the coffee shops, etc., can accept the Stanford card plan as well. Um, also printing and copies in like libraries and dormitories, they charge for some printing and copies. Take the university ID card for that. And that's called the Stanford card plan. We set a, a limit, it's, it's uh, basically, I say a line of credit, but uh, that's kind of how it works. Um, so once a term, you, the student can purchase up to or charge up to $1,000 worth during that term. 
if they pay it off, they don't get another thousand. It's a thousand dollars per term. So during the academic year, they have discretionary funds of about three thousand dollars, thousand dollars each term to buy these to buy these these things. Um, I will tell you that um, it's very important not to confuse this as scholarship or um, free money because it does get billed monthly and it is due the following um, due date, whatever charges they, they buy. You know, if they don't use it, there's nothing on the bill. But if they do choose to use it, um, it's, it's, it's there. Most of our students never exceed $400 during the entire term on this on this plan. Most of our students are in the $100, $200 range of, of actual use. So they're just using it for those emergencies in lieu of cash. It's an opportunity for everybody to be um, able to get what they need and not have to, to rely on having you know, cash or a credit card in, in, their, in their pockets. I want to also tell you about an item that's going to appear on the student bill, and that's insurance. I'm not here to talk about the insurance plan. Um, we have uh, Vaden Healthcare on, on campus can, can go into detail with you on that. What I am here to do is to remind you and tell you that we are, at Stanford University requires students have insurance. Therefore, I am required to bill you for it unless you have waived the insurance. Students have until sep September 15th to waive insurance. Waiving insurance means they have insurance perhaps under your, the parent's plan. And if they're covered by you and if you, if you want to waive that cost, the students need to go online and waive this by September 15th. I bring this to your attention also because this is probably one of the number one complaints that my office and my staff deal with, are that students have insurance, but they didn't waive it. And I'm, I have, it, they're, they're signed up in the plan. And you know, once you sign up for a plan, getting refunded is very difficult, and it's very frustrating, and I get that. This cost is very expensive. It's a very good program. It is a very good program, and I encourage you, if you want to look at, you know, take a look at them. It's very good, but it's also expensive. This is the annual cost. Once they're in it for one term, it's, they're in it for the whole term. We do break that cost out and bill it in three separate terms. So one-third, one-third, one-third. But it's still a very big number if you don't have to have it. So that is just my reminder that, that, that this is going to be billed but must be waived. Now, we do send notices out to students um, probably beginning in August to let them know that if they do have insurance that, that they need to kind of a reminder to do this so that they don't get burdened with this cost. Here are some items that I unfortunately have to bill for that I don't really like to bill for that, that I want to just say um, if, if students don't do certain things, they get penalized. And these are the fees that can be avoided mostly. Um, a late study list fee. The university requires students be enrolled the first day of class. If they are not enrolled, they can be penalized for what's called a late study list. Now, this is, this is done, of course, because the scheduling and um, professors and trying to arrange this, everything is costly. And if, if students don't enroll by this date, then we don't have a good um, enrollment number. And so therefore, there is a fee for not enrolling. Clearly, to avoid this, they just have to enroll by the due date. Their advisors, when they get to campus in September, will, will definitely tell them about this and make sure that this is done. Um, in the event that a bill is not paid, um, it does, go, it does um, get assessed a late payment fee of 1% of the balance. So yep, that's like 12% over the course of a year. So please um, um, be aware of that. Um, ID card is another item that can be avoided. ID cards are very valuable. They get you into dorms. They get you into libraries. They purchase your, they, they get you into your um, dining halls. They allow you to use a Stanford card plan, a host of things. So they're very valuable. So if they're, if they're lost, there is a fee. So the most important thing is hang on, hang on to the ID fee. 
Um, lastly, and I mention this because this, this fee can get quite expensive, um, damage to the, to the residence halls. And I know that the students have, have probably seen and signed the documents, but the, but the um, damage fees are very avoidable. It's just simply treat your, treat your dorm room like you would treat your, your you know, home, your room at home. Or maybe that's not, and maybe that's not a good, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, maybe we should say that a little differently, okay. <laughs> anyway, just be aware that the housing office, um, if they have to go in and, and, and change carpet or, or fill holes or stuff, there, there is a fee for that. Alrighty, so now that you understand how the, how the charges come on and what to pay, um, I, I want to tell you how to pay. Um, Stanford ePay is our online and billing, online billing and presentment um, service. It uh, comes right, it's connected to our, um, all of our accounts and our billings, and students will have auto, automatically have access to that. You notice I keep saying the student's bill, the student's bill. So let me just be very clear. We hold the student responsible for the payment of their bill. They're the ones that's getting the um, um, uh, benefit of the education, and they're the ones that's getting the education and the, um, the class work. So therefore, they're the ones that we hold responsible. I hold responsible for payment of the bill. However, we definitely recognize the tremendous support and the tremendous um, uh, uh, help that, that is given by the, the parents and others. So there is a way for you to get a copy of the bill. There's a way for you to go in and pay the bill. And that's done by having your son or daughter set you up as what's called an authorized payer. I want, I want one of those for my bills. <laughs> but at any rate, an, an authorized payer is the student, student will go into their account and say, I want, you know, they can authorize mom and dad, they can authorize grandma, gramps, uncles, whoever's, to actually um, have an authorized view of their bill and authorization to pay on their bill. So this is the way that you as parents, if you want to go in and make payment for your student, you can do it right through Stanford ePay. You would get a lot, your student would give you a logon, secured logon, password, et cetera, and then you would go in and be able to view and pay the bill. If you're set up as an authorized payer, just as your student gets an email notification, the bill is now presented, all authorized payers would also get an email. Your son or daughter would, would put your email address in or an, an email address that, that you would want to, to get notification and Stanford would notify you that the bill is now ready for, for viewing and, and payment. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, some of our families are a little intimidated by coming up with the, all that big balance that they may owe after the aid has, has dispersed. Um, and would say, yeah, I'd really like to spread that out. Rather than pay three big bills, I would like to pay nine. And you can do that. Um, we have implemented a, a, what's called an installment payment plan, and it's really a budget resource So until you get used to it. And we, what we find is that many, many of our families use this for the first year until they say, yeah, okay, I need to, I need to you know, budget myself. So they use this, and basically from July to March, we could set up nine basically nine, pay, nine monthly payments that allows you to do it at a pace. Because most of us, and me included, we don't get paid by the quarter. I get paid e either monthly or every, you know, every other week. So coming up with a, with a really large balance on a quarterly basis is kind, can be kind of daunting. So this is something that we've implemented. You can, I, I think there's a link at the end of the slideshow, and these slides will be available on the financial aid uh, website, so the link will take you to it, and it'll let you determine how much you want to want to schedule out for that. But for notes, um, there is there is no setup. There's no cost to you if you want to use this. There's no setup fees. If you miss a payment that's set up in your installment program, there's no penalty, um, and you get email reminders prior to the date. It is just a convenience for you to help help if you do. We have um, some number of families do we do see use this, and it's it's helpful for them. You know, they made this. 
they made a green button to go forward and a red button to go backwards so that it would be easy. It's called age appropriate, you know? And I got to tell you, I hit the red button. Sorry about that. So, um, all righty. Um, so, so sometimes, let me just say that sometimes, um, based on the aid and based on the scholarships, more can hit the, you know, the good thing is your account could come up with a credit balance. And that does occur. So if the, if the credit balance is a result of something that is dispersed over from the financial aid office, we refund that to the student. We run refunds three times a week just to make sure that if there is a credit to that account that those students get that money. And we want them to sign up for direct deposit. You'll see that in a lot of your literature. And we will refund via direct deposit. And that simply means that three times a week when we hit the refund button for that over, over um, uh, credit, that money will land in the account within 24 hours. We recognize that in a lot, a lot of cases, many of our families, that's very, very important that we get that money in their hands as quickly as possible because maybe that money's intended to, to buy that um, airfare to, to go home or to, to buy that cost of attendance that I'm not, I'm not billing you for and they need it. So we will refund that and it's important that the students sign up for direct deposit. Best, fast way to get it. Um, quick word on that, we have many banking opportunities. If your son or daughter doesn't already have a banking relationship, there, um, I, I'm not promoting any. I'll just tell you that there are some here on Stanford's campus. Wells Fargo, which is in this building, as well as the federal, Stanford Federal Credit Union, also in this building, that um, would be more than happy to, to have the students open, an, open up an account with them and set up for direct deposit. Another reason that um, the account might, might come up with the credit is let's say that you, um, you pay the balance that you owed out of, out of pocket or the student pays out of pocket and then they adjust a course that had a fee associated with it. And say they had a $100 music lesson that they were billed for and then they adjusted it and it came off and it showed up as a credit. That money, if it's, not, if it's not from financial aid, that money is just going to stay on the account to cover incidentals. At some point, if, uh, if the student either graduates or wants to have that money back, they can request it and we'd be glad to refund it. But primarily, it just covers any, any future. Okay. These are nice things to have, nice, nice places to be in. Oh, terrific. So I want to talk a moment about understanding um, students understanding finance. So I think that um, Karen had mentioned to you that, that she had hoped that you would sit down with um, your son or daughter and talk about um, you know, the, the importance of how you're, going to, how you're going to meet the needs, et cetera. And one of the things that um, Karen and I both are very passionate about, and we, we serve on a board here at Stanford that is looking to improve financial literacy for students. This is not something that's unique to Stanford by any means. Um, the United States is very um, um, uh, um, eagerly looking to provide financial literacy for our, our young adults. And as much as many of our parents want to nurture and protect and, and keep them to where they just focus on the classroom, I'm here to ask your help to where they begin to understand the importance of managing their own finances. So Karen and I may not be professors in the classroom, but we are trying to teach or help teach children into becoming adults. And one of the things that, that we're very... Um, um, excited about is a program that just launched this year and is going to continue into next year. We call it Mind Over Money. It has a website listed here and you can find it on, on the slide deck. Um, this is intended to, to provide education for students so they understand not only the things that are in the classroom, but they understand simple things like how to budget. If I'm going to get an excess or if I know that I need to have 2,600, you know, what does that look like? And how, I don't want to spend it all in week one and go to Nordstrom's. And, and these things do occur, you know, because, because they can. 
Um, so, you know, understanding how to budget the funds that they have, because they're not at home with you. They're here. And, and peer pressure can, oh, let's, all, let's go down to Palo Alto and, you know, whatever. You know, being mindful that, that money is, is the student's responsibility and you as parents are just here to help them, help educate them, just as, as Karen and I are. So I just wanted to say a word about the program that we see very, very important to the well-being of our country and our world in the future is what our students do today. And helping them with the real life um, challenges is, is something that we could use your assistance in. Especially as a bill collector, I, you know, I, I like to, um, uh, the more I can let them know if in the front, in the back end, I don't see them because they understand the importance of, of that part of life as well. All right, very quickly, I think we've got, um, I've got two minutes left before I wanted to go to Q&A. So um, my timing was perfect. <laughs> so today's takeaways, if you get nothing else, the bill is a student's responsibility. You want your son or daughter to give you the, um, I'm sorry, the bill is a student's responsibility. You want to be an authorized payer, if you want to, if you want to contribute and pay. It's the one thing they all do without you having to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a problem. Yeah, they, they're, they're pretty quick to do that. Um, the second thing, just a reminder. If your insurance is adequate and you do not want to be billed for $4,900 this year, make sure you waive insurance by the 15th of September. Third thing, make sure students set up direct deposit. We want to get their money, their excess money in their hands as quickly as possible. And lastly, Karen said this right before she uh, stepped away. She goes, please notify the financial office if your fi financial situation changes. Now, if you win the lotto, I want in on it. <laughs> Percentage, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So at this moment, we have about 20 minutes left of our presentation according to the um, schedule, but we want to open it up for general Q&A. Okay? I'll put that last slide up with some. We'll just leave that up there with some uh, URLs and how to reach us in, in here. Why don't we split either side of the screen? Um, so... What questions do you have? Do you feel ready now to take on the rest of the weekend? <laughs> Go ahead. Just, just one question. Uh, if we take the monthly installment plan and if we miss a monthly installment, then what happens? If you choose the monthly installment plan yeah. and you miss a monthly payment. Okay. Um, you get no penalty as long as the full balance for those months are paid by that due date in September. For, for example, July, August, and September is, is the first one. As long as all of them are paid by September 15th when the bill is due, there's no penalty. Yes? Um, if we waive the health insurance thing, but if like my son's sick or a little bit, just a little bit here and there, is there any like small service that we can sign up on? So we didn't talk much about, there, there, you will be billed, and it's not waivable, a campus health service fee of $210 a, a quarter. And what that does is give all students basic access to our health center, the Vaden Health Center. So yes, sore throats, you know, a primary care service, uh, they go to Vaden for that, and that's what's covered under that $210 quarterly fee, um, up to 10 mental health visits. You know, so there, things, basic things are covered with that fee. It's when they you know, need to go to the hospital or need specialty care, that's when health insurance would kick in. Thank you. Okay, yeah, you've been trying to ask a question yes. for a while. Hello, my name is John Johnson, I'm one of the pro pros, and I was inquiring about the Public Service Loan Award Forgiveness Program. Yeah. So um, I'm work for a nonprofit already, but can I, am I able to count those hours that I've already been serving? So it starts, when does that uh, So the 10-year clock for public service loan forgiveness starts when you enter repayment, okay. which is six months after you're no longer enrolled at least half time. Okay, so it's okay. okay. Yeah, All so right. unfortunately, they don't let you take credit for what you've already done. Okay. Are you Thank able you. to discuss uh, personal situation? Today? So personal situations, if you want to head over to the financial aid office, Montag Hall, we've got staff there who are taking appointments. 
And I've got Ron over in the corner right there. Raise your hand, Ron. Mm -hmm. uh, Ron and I and TJ will stick around for a little while after the session is over if you just have a quick question. But if you want us to be able to see your stuff, um, head over to the office. Over here. Um, if I were to get over the student contribution and scholarships, would it be possible to like spread it out over over a few years so that it only covers the student contribution? So let's yeah, let's talk some more about outside scholarships. And and I think your question is, what happens if I get more than my student responsibility? Are there other options? Can I spread it out over other years? Um, and you can do that by working with the agencies who have given you the scholarship. If you send the funds to Stanford, we're obliged to use them in the year that we receive them. We won't hold them for you for future years. But if you go back to the Rotary Club or the PTA and you say, you know what, I've got a ton of money for this year, but I really need it for my sophomore year, or my junior year, or my senior year, can, can, can we do it then? Um, and they are often very willing to do that. Yes. How realistic is uh, the eight to ten hours of work study time with the workload? That's Great. Study? Thank you for that question. Because I have a soapbox that I love to get on about student employment. So did everybody hear? The question was, how realistic is eight to ten hours a week of, of work? Um, and I think it is very realistic. Mm -hmm. Students are able to commit that and, and more in some cases. Um, and I know all of you are thinking, my child works so hard to get here, I don't want them to have to work while they're here, right? There is research that has been done that shows that students who are working at that kind of level, 8 to 10 hours a week, actually do better academically than their peers who are not working at all. Because think about this for a second. They're going from the high school environment where their days are very regimented. You know, the bell rings to tell them when to go to the next class. And, you know, you've been driving them around for years for all of their after school activities. They are very busy. Well, they are as busy here, but their day is less regimented, right? They, you know, we often don't see them before noon. They, um, you know, they're making their own choices about how they structure their day. And so having a job with someone like me or TJ as their supervisor, where they have to show up and make a commitment, um, actually gives some structure to their day. And if they're able to work on campus, the folks on campus know what the schedules are for you know, when they have midterms and finals, et cetera. Um, and they're actually better connected to resources on campus. So don't shy away from working on campus. Um, jobs at Stanford, there are two, two ways to get jobs at Stanford, either federal work study, which is for our lowest income students. Um, it does make it a little bit easier for those students who are eligible for federal work study to find jobs because the hiring department doesn't have to pay for them. I do, um, out of our federal money. Uh, but other students who want to work on campus, even if you're not been awarded need-based aid, there are jobs available for students on campus. Can't find them now. Have to wait till September. Um, it, you know, when they're here on campus is the time, yeah, hi, TJ will hire one or two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I um, actually, the, the financial literacy program, yeah. um, we're looking for students to, to work for us, to help us, you know, just develop what that program looks like. So, you know, currently we have, you know, five to ten students that are helping us build the program, and that is a great way, and it's... So there are lots of opportunities yeah. like that on campus, and uh, the... Uh, Career Services Center has a website called Handshake um, where students will be able to see those on-campus jobs posted. Many departments don't get their acts together to post those jobs until September, so don't, don't expect to look for those now. Yes? Is it advisable for students to work on their first semester? Is it advisable for students to work in their first semester? I, I think it is a reasonable expectation, yes. Absolutely. It helps them sort of get situated. Yes? I just have a comment because um, I graduated from Stanford Med School and it was a choice to, for some of the parents here who are thinking, well, you know, my kid's getting a scholarship at a UC school, Stanford's so much more expensive, and that was one of my concerns, you know, my family's concerns. 
as well when I was going through the process. And let me just reassure you that I was able through all of the things. I was in the financial aid office all the time too, but Stanford really makes it possible. And I graduated out of med school with loans, very little loans compared to even my my you know my friends who are at UC med schools. And um, and I worked through, but it didn't really feel like that. I mean the the environment at Stanford, I mean, I, I did my undergrad at UCSD, so I can kind of compare to UC versus a Stanford education, and it's so different. They're so, you know, individualized. They really care about the individual person in your situation, and so if that's something that you're still deciding, um, I, I really wouldn't worry about it, and I was just, you know, I'm so happy my daughter's here, and we're just so thrilled, and. The financial aid should be the least of your problem. Um, your kids got in, say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that testimonial. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. So the three big bills are this approximately one third of the total? Are the three big bills approximately one third of the total? Yes. Yes. Roughly. Yeah, roughly. Fall quarter is a little more expensive than winter and spring because all there are, especially for first year students, there are some one time fees that get assessed in that fall quarter. Um, and uh, believe it or not, dining is a little bit more in fall than it is in winter and a little bit less again in spring. So the difference for a first year student can be as much as. Um, have the new student fee and the orientation fee. Those two alone are seven hundred dollars. The dining will go down approximately two hundred dollars each quarter. So if you factor autumn versus spring, spring will be cheaper. But the tuition and the housing will be the same each quarter. Got it. So don't let that first fall bill freak you out. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Meal that, yeah, we don't have a lot of information about the meal plans. Um, like, is it like a basic plan or maybe an upgraded plan or is it just one plan? Yeah, I am not. So I we're am not really experts. <laughs> and I, I think there are going to be some folks available through the weekend to talk about At the uh, meal plan options. Yeah. Uh, 19 meals. The basics. Students can choose whether they want 15 meals and points. It's going to be the same price as the 19 meals. Yeah. Be the same price regardless. There are some adjustments that students can make in how they get their meals, so, but for the it's the same price for them. It's three meals a day on the weekdays and two. Uh oh, you okay? <laughs> yes. So, uh, you know, what happens next in this process is. Uh, once students have all committed after May 1, we know who our class is, um, Stanford will start communicating with you through a process called approaching Stanford, right? And on a regular basis over the summer, this is when you get all of those details about the meal plans and we're going to prompt you again to sign up for the installment plan and take care of health insurance and all of that stuff um, in much greater detail happens at that point. Yeah. Sure yeah. And then everything's available online. Yeah. It goes real smoothly. Question. The question about the waiver for good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, still morning. Uh, good morning. Congratulations to the students and the parents. A lot of us were breathing earth a lot easier when we get those letters on the thirty first. Um, the waiver for the health insurance. Once the students officially commit and pay the $200, can they go ahead and do the waiver then, or is there, do they need to wait until you communicate with us after May 1st to start um, the process? I don't believe the account is set up yet. Yeah, um, it I, won't be available until, until over the summer. Yeah, over the summer. when that will become available. And uh, if you've got questions about the health insurance, you know, whether to use the health insurance or not to use the health insurance, Vaden, vaden.sanford.edu has got a really great sort of comparison tool on their website about what gets covered and what doesn't. If you're worried about the cost, and for our families who are receiving full financial aid, 
uh, those zero parent contribution families especially, uh, Stanford will uh, increase the cost of attendance and increase scholarship to handle that health insurance cost if it's something you need, um, not if it's a nice to have, <laughs> if it's something you need. Okay. The instructions will be there, so you just have to upload your insurance card. Yeah, exactly. You provide ID. information about what insurance you do have and, and waive Stanford's insurance. And then my second question about the line of credit, is that something they have to opt into or is it automatic? Excellent question. Um, everyone, every student is eligible, but they do have to opt into it. So if they don't opt in, then they don't have access. Correct. You'll know if, as an authorized payer, you start to see charges for, you know, Jamba Juice. Um, that's the card plan. <laughs> I think there was a question right here. Oh yeah, I just want to know, like, for next year, uh, time deadline, would the parent will be informed uh, for the next? Yeah, year? absolutely. So um, I I said the cycle for uh, renewing aid uh, for continuing students. The deadline is April thirtieth. Uh, and that's not going to change every year. The FAFSA now becomes available uh, the 1st of October, so you can fill it out any time during that window. Um, just know we're not going to do anything with it until after April 30th. All right. I think that looks like all the questions we have. Um, Karen and Ron and myself will hang back if you have specific questions you'd like to have. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of the weekend. Absolutely. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you.